So our first session is on the kingdom of God. Now, what are we going to be learning in this session? Well, we're going to be learning about what was our created purpose. Why did God make us? And what happened to our lives when the kingdom of darkness came to our lives and how Jesus Christ came to restore us to his plans and his purposes for us. Now, in order for this to happen more and more in our hearts today, I want to call you to rise up in faith, to really believe that the Word of God and the Spirit of God are going forth right now, and the Lord wants you to encounter Him at a deeper level today. How are you going to do that? Through responding to Him by faith. You know, you may have had a difficult week. You may be struggling today. Maybe you're feeling tired. But faith is not dependent upon how we feel. You can have great faith and be really tired. You can have great faith and be going through a storm or a struggle in your life right now because faith is simply a response to God. Faith is simply saying to God, Lord, I am weak. I need you. And so right now, according to the truth that I've heard by the power of your spirit, I reach out by faith. I respond to you, and I ask you to come and bring what I've heard now. Bring the truth of your word alive within me, within my heart. That is what the Lord wants to do today. Obviously, God's not going to finish his entire work in our hearts today. But he does want to do something. So really what we're doing is this. We are encountering these truths for ourselves so that we can do what? As Danny said already, give them away to others so that we become those who have encountered God and his great love and his great power, those who have and are continuing to be transformed. And so we have encountered, but we've also learned principles that we now can minister to others in the church, in our cell groups, in whatever area of ministry God has called us to be in, we now, having encountered it, can give it away to others. And so those are the two things that God wants to accomplish, because Jesus said, Freely, freely, you have received. Freely, freely, give. What's the principle there? The principle is this. You can only give away to others what you have already received from God. That's true in the natural, isn't it? I can only give you a gift if I have it. And so that's what Jesus is saying. Today, receive. Today, believe. Today, rise up in faith and say to God, Lord, I want more of you. Are you hungry today? Are you thirsty for more? If you're not, ask God and say, Lord, make me hungry. Make me thirsty for more of you. Why? Because it's only the hungry who eat, and it's only the thirsty who drink. And so we want to be those who come today and deeply encounter God. So the kingdom of God, what is the kingdom of God? How can we enter in to God's kingdom in our lives even more? So I'm going to start by asking a question. Why did God create you? Why did God create any of us? I believe as we read the scriptures, we say that, see that there are three primary reasons why God made us. And the first and greatest reason is this. He made us for his glory. That we would receive his glory and that we would reflect his glory to others. That's why God made us. So what is the glory of God then? How can we receive it more? How can we reflect it to others? Well, we sing about the glory of God a lot, don't we? We talk about the glory of God. We often pray, Lord, send us your glory. Show us your glory. Let your glory come to this church even more. What are we asking for? 
when we're asking to see and encounter and reflect the glory of God, which was our created purpose. Well, let's read Genesis, no, sorry, Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 33, and we're going to read verses 18 and 19. It says this, Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And then let's go down now to chapter 34, verses 5 to 8. And now the Lord is coming, and he's going to show his glory to Moses. And here, chapter 34, verse 5, it says this, Then the Lord came down in the cloud, and he stood there with him, and he proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation. And Moses bowed to the ground at once, and he worshiped the Lord. So what's happened here? God has shown his glory to Moses. Now, when he showed his glory to Moses, what did he show him? He showed him what he's like. He showed him his character. God revealed to Moses more of who he is. It's like God is standing behind a curtain and we say, Lord, show us your glory. And he opens the curtain and we get a greater revelation of who God is, the strong God, the loving God, the kind God, the compassionate God, the gracious God. God, in all of his attributes and character, wants to reveal himself to us throughout our lives, and that is his glory. And we were called to receive this glory and to reflect this glory to others. That's who we are. Now imagine with me for a moment, before the creation of the world, only God existed. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And when the Father would look at the Son, what would he see? His glory. And when the Son would look at the Father, he would see his glory. And there the glory of the Lord was forever in existence. But for some reason, God decided to create. What is creation? Creation is the overflow of the glory of God. Imagine with me for a moment. You're standing before a mountain. How do you feel? What are you thinking? You're looking at this mountain and you're thinking, wow, big, powerful. Great, strong. Why do you think this when you look at the mountain? Why do you feel this? Because that mountain was created to shout forth, God is great. God is powerful. God is big. Or when you're walking through the forest by it, by a stream, and the wind is blowing through the leaves, and the birds are singing, how do you feel? You feel peace. You feel joy. You feel life. Why? Because the river and the trees and the leaves and the wind and the birds and all of creation is shouting forth, God is a God of peace. He's a God of joy. He's a God of life. And that is why in Romans chapter 1, it says that everyone will be without excuse. No one will be able to stand before God and say, 
I didn't know. I didn't know about you. What will God say? I gave you creation. And creation speaks about me. Now, the amazing thing is this. You and I, man and woman, are the only part of God's creation created in his image. You and I are God going public. That's who we are. We're not God. We'll never be God. The mountain isn't God. The river isn't God. The trees are not God. But they were created to show forth the glory of the invisible God. That is why you were made. That is why God breathed life into you so that everywhere you go, every single day, people will be able to say, there is a God. I see it. When you smile at someone, God says this, it's more than just a smile. When you hug someone or encourage someone, when you love someone, when you serve someone, it is more than just an action, more than just an expression. Why? Because God has filled you with his glory. God has filled you with purpose. God has filled you with mission. And the mission of our lives is to reflect the glory of God. So when I smile at my wife, God says it's more than a smile. It's my glory. It's my joy. That's why you were created. And I pray that every single day you will say, thank you, Lord. I want your glory. Thank you, Lord. I want to show forth your glory. Lord, how today, how to my wife, how to my children, how to my husband, how to my coworkers, how to those that live on my street, can I show them you, your glory, your presence, because of who I am. That's why you were made. That's the primary reason. The second reason, which is attached to that reason, is that you and I were created to live in a love relationship with God. As a child, one who is created to their father, the creator. We were created, our hearts were created to come alive in the love of our heavenly father. We see that in the Genesis, don't we? It says God would come down and he'd walk in the garden with Adam and Eve. He was their father. He loved them. He wasn't just this great almighty God. He was also a father, one who cared, one who loved, one who walked with them and talked with them and lived among them. That's why we were created to have that intimate knowledge of God as a father who loves us. And the third reason for our creation, and this is really important because we're going to see how our created purpose were stolen from us, but how God is restoring them through Jesus Christ. So the third reason for our creation, and I want to read it here in Genesis chapter 1, Verses 28, 27, and 28, it says this. Genesis 1, 27, and 28. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So God created mankind, man and woman, to rule over his creation, to have authority here on the earth under God. So as long as we lived under God's authority, men and women would have authority to rule the earth. It actually says here in Psalm 115, verse 16, listen to this. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to mankind. This was God's created purpose, 
that we would be rulers and have authority in this realm under the authority of God. This is why we were created, for his glory, to live in a love relationship, to rule and have authority here upon the earth. But something happened. And there was another creation, wasn't there? And what I mean by that is not a physical creation, but a heavenly creation where God created angels and archangels to exist with him in the heavenly realms. And there was one very powerful angel. And we know him now as Satan. But at one time, he stood in the presence of God. He was beautiful. He was glorious. But pride came into his heart. His beauty overwhelmed him. And it came into his heart that he wanted to be like God. He wanted to rule. He wanted to have authority. Let me read to you here. From Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 14. And this is talking about Satan. It says this. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the mountains. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zephon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. Listen to this. I will make myself like the Most High. That's what Satan said. And so what did God do? Well, as we know, God took Satan and a third of the angels, and he cast them down to the earth out of his presence. But let me ask you a question. When Satan was cast down to the earth, did he lose his love for power? Did he lose his desire to rule and have authority? No. What did he see? What did he see when he was on the earth? He saw that God had given authority in the earthly realm to Adam and Eve. And he wanted it. He lusted after it. He wanted to rule and have authority. He wanted to be like God. So what did he do? Well, as we know, he took the form of a serpent, went into the garden. And what power did Satan use to get what he wanted, to get the authority he wanted? What power did he use? Lies and deception. He goes up to Eve, and what does he say? Did God really say that you can't eat from any of the trees in the garden? And right away, right away she sees that's a lie. And she says, no. God said we can eat from all the trees except for one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when we eat from it or touch it, we will die. But Satan doesn't give up, does he? What does he say? You won't die. You won't die. He wants to create doubt. What was he looking for? What was Satan seeking? He was seeking this. He was seeking the agreement of Adam and Eve. He wanted Adam and Eve to agree with him and believe him rather than God. And that's what he's seeking today. That's what he's seeking from you as we're going to see throughout the teachings, a common thread. Satan wants us to believe his lies. Satan wants us to come under the power of deception, just like Adam and Eve did. He wants us to sign a contract with him. He wants us to say, you are right. And when he gets our agreement, what does he also get? He gets authority in our lives. He gets authority in an area of our lives as we choose to believe his lies rather than the truth of God. What did Jesus say in John chapter 8? He said this. 
that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, what will the truth set you free from? The lies of the devil. Because we see in the scripture two streams, and we're going to talk about this later in more depth, but we see two streams. We see the stream of truth and the stream of lies. And the Bible always teaches that a lie believed brings bondage. But truth received and believed brings freedom and life. And so Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus brought truth. And truth sets us free from the bondages and lies of the enemy and breaks his authority in our lives. And that's what's going to happen today at a greater level and a deeper level in our hearts. So here's Eve. The Satan has come to her. He's lied to her. He said to her, you won't die. In other words, doubt. And so she starts thinking, who's right? God or Satan? Who am I going to agree with? And she decides to agree with Satan. She in her heart, it's not articulated in the Bible, but this is what she had to be thinking. She had to think, God isn't right Satan is right. I agree with him, and I obey him. I take the fruit. I eat it. I give it to my husband. He takes it. He eats it. And both of us have believed the lie and obeyed Satan rather than God. And, of course, we know what happened, right? All of our created purposes, the glory of God, the love of God as a father and our rulership over creation were taken from us when this wall of disobedience goes up between us and our heavenly father. How did it happen? It happened, I'll say again, because Eve chose to agree with Satan rather than God. And in that agreement, she signed a contract in her heart saying, I agree with you, I obey you, and therefore, what did she do? She came out, and Adam came out from under the authority and relationship of, with God and placed themselves under the power and authority of what the Bible calls the kingdom of darkness or the dominion of darkness in agreement they came under the authority of the power of Satan and his evil kingdom. What is the kingdom of darkness? Well, the kingdom of darkness is composed of the enemies of God. And the Bible tells us that God has three enemies. One enemy we know, Satan, right? Now, Satan, through temptation, brings what? Sin. And what is the wage of sin? Death. So Satan, sin, and death are the enemies of God. They are invaders into God's kingdom. They are thieves. And these three powers compose what the Bible calls the kingdom of darkness. And it is under this kingdom that Adam and Eve have placed themselves. And now they are slaves of sin. And because they are slaves of sin and under the power of Satan, they are under the curse of death. Do you remember we said that Satan wanted to be like God, right? That was his goal. We saw it right there, Isaiah chapter 14. I want to be God. And what did God do? God created us to receive and reflect his glory. We were created in his image. And so what does Satan do? He copies God because he wants to be God. 
and now Adam and Eve are under his kingdom. They're under his rule. So what does he begin to do? He begins to recreate them in his image. For what purpose? To receive and reflect his glory, his characteristics, his will, rather than the glory and character and will of our Heavenly Father. And every single person born since Adam and Eve are born under the power of this demonic kingdom into slavery to sin and under the curse of death. And what the enemy does is he puts into you his glory, his character, his will from the very day you're born. Why? So that you will reflect it to others and you will give it away and he will perpetuate his kingdom. And that's why we've been hurt. And that's why we sin. And that's why we struggle with rejection and feeling unloved. That's why we argue and fight with those who are closest to us. That's why we believe lies instead of truth. That's why our hearts are often empty of the love that we need. Because the enemy is coming and robbing us day after day after day of our created purposes. And he wants you to both receive and give away his character his heart, his will to other people. And that is the world we live in now. I want to ask you a question. In what ways today are you still struggling with the power of the kingdom of darkness in an area of your life? Is it in your thinking? Do you struggle in your thinking? Is it in your heart, in your emotions? Maybe you're struggling with not feeling loved or valued or accepted deep in your heart today. Maybe it's in your bodies. Maybe it's in your relationships. Maybe there's division and anger and strife within some important relationship of your life. And the power of that ungodly kingdom is coming and it wants to have a foothold in your life. The enemy is seeking an area of your life, even as a Christian, where he can do his work. How does he do it? He does it the same way he did with Adam and Eve. He comes and he lies to you. And he says things like, your spouse really doesn't love you. Or your parents really don't love you. You're the least important in your family. And he wounds you. And he brings experiences to your life that cause you to doubt the love of God, that cause you to doubt the fact that you're significant and accepted and affirmed and loved by your Heavenly Father, and you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. And he comes with a lie and he says, No, you can't. And he puts a wound there. Maybe a thought that we can't get rid of, a condemning thought, a guilty thought that we keep playing over and over in our minds. And the enemy has a foothold in our thinking or in our heart or in our actions or some way and somehow the enemy has come with a lie and you even unknowingly have agreed with him. And in that agreement, we give him authority to work in our lives and in our relationships because he only has one will. His will is to keep you from the heart of God and living the life that God has called you to live. He does not want you to receive and reflect the glory of God. He doesn't want you to live the life that you were created to live. So instead of smiling at my wife and loving her and encouraging her, which is the glory of God, what is the enemy's plan for my life, for her life, for our marriage? Division, rejection, words of discouragement. Why? So that she will be wounded. And then she will maybe believe, 
my husband doesn't really love me. Maybe I'm not lovable. And the lie goes in to her heart. And the enemy, over months and years, it grows, and this lie takes root. And soon what happens? Her belief that I don't love her, that she's not lovable, turns in upon herself, and she starts rejecting herself. And it deepens, and it deepens, and it deepens. Rejection from me, rejection from others, and now self-rejection and the enemy has come, which what started was a lie, has taken root, has grown, and now becomes a way of thinking and a way of acting. She's still saved. God deeply loves her. And the transforming word and spirit of God are always here. But what do we need to do? We need to recognize the seed, which is the lie. We need to recognize that and reject it by the power of God. And we're going to talk about how we do that. But I'm starting here by setting the table so that we can all see clearly what the enemy is trying to do, what the enemy has done, and what Jesus came to do. I want you to go away today seeing the two roads very, very clearly because what often happens in the church and in Christians' lives, is they're gray. And they mix together. But I want there to be two roads, two wills, and that you will choose today to completely leave this road. And in the power of truth, by the Spirit of God, you'll come to this road. And what will happen? A new seed will come into that area of your life. A new seed of truth. And that will take root, and you'll begin to think, you know what? God accepts me. God loves me. And even though my husband or spouse or my friend hasn't got to that place yet, that's okay. I can bless them because God is my source of life. He is my Father. I connect with Him. My heart is coming alive. And then I come to the place where I can do what? I can move in the opposite spirit. I can bless those who rejected me. Why? Because I want to show the glory of God. If I hate those or reject those who reject me, or I have unforgiveness in my heart, then what am I doing? I'm showing the glory of Satan. I'm expressing his will, and I'm perpetuating it, and I'm planting his seeds, which is what he wanted from the beginning, because he wants to rule the whole earth and pollute it with his glory with his character, so that it will be perpetuated all over the earth. And every single one of us have experienced that all the way from birth up until now. But here's the key. How are you going to respond going forward? Because if you choose to respond God's way, as we're going to learn today, you will be transformed and become a transformer. And you will change, and your families will change, and your workplaces will change, and your church will change, and your communities will change. And everywhere you go, you will carry and impart the glory of God, which is why you were made. So this was Satan's plan from the beginning, to rule, to have authority. And he used it for evil. And what we need to identify today is this. What areas of our lives does the enemy still have power in? That's what, that's what the Lord's going to come and identify. And then we're going to bring truth, the power of the Spirit, and the love of our Heavenly Father right into those areas. We're not only going to do it today, but we're going to learn how to do it every day so that we can grow in it and we can be transformed and we can live the life that God has called us to live. That's good news, isn't it? And that's what the church is about. That's the role of the church, to bring transformation so that all of us can go out and shine the glory of God. So that's the kingdom of darkness. 
That's how it started. That's how it's perpetuated. And that is the goal of the kingdom, bondage and death for everyone, separated from God so that Satan can rule over those people forever. What's God's plan? That's why we're here today. What's God's plan? His plan is that we will encounter his kingdom and all its power and all its glory every day of our lives. So what is the kingdom of God then? When the Bible actually uses the word kingdom, what does it mean? It means this. Kingdom in the scriptures means the right to rule. That's what it means. So when Adam and Eve agreed with Satan, what did they give him? Because remember, they were the rulers of the earth under God. So what did they give Satan when he brought his kingdom, tried to bring his kingdom? What? They gave him their agreement. And in saying, you are right and we obey you, they gave him rulership in an area of their lives. They gave him rulership over them. He now had a kingdom. He had rulership upon the earth. But then Jesus came. And Jesus brought the kingdom of God, which is God's right to rule and reign over all of his creation. God has that right because he is the creator. And so he's come himself through his son to take it back because the thief has come. That's John 10.10. 10. The thief, which is Satan, comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. What does he want to steal, kill, and destroy? The will of God. That's what he wants to steal. But Jesus said, I have come. I have come. And I will bring life and life in great abundance. My rulership will be life. And so what did Jesus do? And we're setting the table here for all that we're going to talk about. We're setting the table here for transformation. So what did Jesus do? Well, we know he came to earth. And at about the age of 30, he goes to the Jordan River and he encounters John the Baptist. And he says to John the Baptist, baptize me so that all righteousness will be fulfilled. What is Jesus saying? That my baptism in the Jordan will foreshadow my death and resurrection on the cross. And so Jesus is in the Jordan River and John takes him and he plunges him under the water, foreshadowing his death. And then John lifts him up out of the river, foreshadowing his resurrection from death to life. And what happens when Jesus comes out of the water? He hears a voice. It's the voice of his father and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And then the dove comes and settles upon Jesus, which is the Holy Spirit. So there at the beginning of Jesus' ministry is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then it says this, the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. For 40 days and 40 nights, he is tempted by Satan, and he's fasting. Why? Why didn't he just send him out to start to preach the gospel? Why did he send him into the wilderness to be tempted and to fast? Here's the answer, and this is very, very important. Jesus is the last Adam, right? Jesus is the next Adam. What do I mean by that? Well, Adam was the first person ever created, and Adam was the representative of all of us. He was our head. He was the first one, and that man was tempted by Satan, and what did he do? He sinned. He fell into sin. Our representative fell into sin. And because of that sin, he and Eve came under the powers of darkness and slavery to sin 
Satan, and death. And that is the inheritance that we got from Adam. And every single person born into Adam is under the curse of sin and death. But now Jesus came, and he's driven into the wilderness, and Satan comes again, and he tempts Jesus, right? He begins to lie to Jesus, even to quote the scriptures to Jesus to try and get Jesus to do the one thing he's always wanted for all of creation, that Jesus would bow down and worship him, the true ruler, the true God. But Jesus does not sin. Even though he's tempted, he does not sin. And so he comes out of the wilderness, the righteous son of God, fully able to be the new representative of God's new creation. Jesus is the next Adam, the one through whom God's going to create a new humanity for his glory. And so Jesus comes out of the wilderness, and in Matthew 4, verse 17, he says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The ruler has come, and he proclaims the kingdom. All over Israel, all around Jerusalem, he begins to proclaim the kingdom of God is near. And then what does he do? Then he begins to demonstrate the kingdom. He proclaims it, and now he demonstrates it. How does he demonstrate it? Well, here in Matthew 12, 20, 28, it says, Jesus says, But if by the finger of God I drive out demons, then you will know that the kingdom of God has come upon you. Why? Why will you know that? I'm going to invite Hillary to come up. Imagine with me for a moment that Hillary here is suffering under a power of depression and despair. So for some reason, the enemy has come into her life and she's feeling despairing. She's feeling condemned. What is that? That is a kingdom. It is the enemy's kingdom. The enemy believes that he has a right to rule and reign in this part of Hillary's life. Now, Jesus comes, or a follower of Jesus comes, and the new kingdom comes, a greater ruler comes, and this ruler, Jesus, or a follower of Jesus, says to this kingdom, get out in the mighty name of Jesus. And that might happen quickly, or it might happen through a process. But there is a leaving of an old ruler, an old kingdom that was in her life. But that's not the end of God's will. Jesus did not come to just kick out the kingdom of darkness. He came to bring in a greater kingdom. He came to bring in a greater rulership, which is the glory of God to Hillary's life. Is despair and rejection and guilt and shame, are these things the glory of God? No. They are the glory of this demonic kingdom. What is the glory of God? Peace, joy, love, life, freedom, truth, all now invading Hillary's life. Why? Because Jesus came to exchange kingdoms. That's why he came. He came to push out the darkness and lies and bondage of the old kingdom. And he came to bring in the glory and goodness and life of his kingdom, of his rulership, into our lives even today. 
Why? Because the kingdom of God does not fully manifest in our lives all at once. It is a process as it advances and advances and takes new ground and brings new hope and brings new life day after day after day as we do what? As we learn to participate with God in our transformation. And that's why we're here today. We are learning principles on how to advance God's kingdom in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, and in those around us. We are learning that we will be those who carry Jesus, carry his spirit to do what? To exchange kingdoms in our life and in the lives of those we love and in the lives of those in this church. That's our mission. That was the mission of Jesus. That's why we go out into the world to recognize darkness by the authority of Jesus, to push it out and to bring the glory of God's kingdom to every life more and more and more every day. So what about you? In what ways is the kingdom of darkness manifesting in your life today? What ways are you struggling? What ways do you struggle throughout the week? Is it with doubts, with fears, with anxiety, with ungodly thoughts, with rejection in your heart, feeling unloved, maybe self-rejection, maybe a habitual sin that you haven't been able to get rid of? Many, many ways the enemy comes to bring a bondage because through that bondage he wants to bring hopelessness because he wants you to give up he wants you to believe there's no more for you this is it you're going to have to struggle for the rest of your life in these areas that is a lie and if you believe that lie then you're not going to come to Jesus to receive his kingdom his freedom more and more every day. So what about you? In what areas does the kingdom of God need to advance in your life? That is the first place we need to come to today. So that we can begin to address them. Not in a general way, but in a specific way. So that we can intentionally Come to God, recognize and reject these areas, know the truth of his word and say, wow, <laughs> there's freedom for me in Jesus every day, and now I want the Holy Spirit to come and apply it to my life. And that is why we're here. So what did God do? He proclaimed the kingdom, he demonstrated the kingdom, and he brought the kingdom to our lives through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's going to be session number two. But I'm going to end this session by saying this. What God did through Christ was this. He came and he saw you in his great love. And it says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, it says that he rescued you from the dominion of darkness and he brought you into the kingdom of the son he loves. And we're going to see in the next session, he did that by uniting you into the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But to end this session, I want to say this. What God did was this. He took you, please see it, out of Adam. That's what he did. He took you out of Adam. Adam is no longer your head. He's no longer your representative. You've been brought out of Adam, and the Father put you into Jesus, your new representative, your new head 
of a whole new creation. And so in Adam, you were cursed with sin and death and separation from God forevermore. That is what Adam gave you because of his disobedience. But we are now in Christ. Our new head, our new representative of a new creation. And what we're going to see in the next session is this. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. You know that one, right? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone. Behold, all things are new. Why? Because you're in Christ now. Your life in Adam is over. Adam is not your representative. You are not in Adam. You are not in that old line. You are not under those curses. And that is the truth. Whether you feel it or not, every day, that is the truth. You're in Christ. And what do you get from Christ? His truth and his life and his love and his transformation, and his power, and his glory every single day flowing into you by your new representative, Jesus Christ. And that's the power of knowing the truth and declaring it over yourself every single day. I'm encouraging you to do it. I'm encouraging you to wake up every day and say, I'm in Christ. I'm not in Adam. I'm not that old person. Yes, I'm not fully transformed yet, but God is going to do it. And I choose to agree with him. Whether I feel like it or not, I live by the truth. And that truth will empower the transforming presence of God in my life. And I will, I will Live the abundant life of Jesus here and now. Because the kingdom of God is greater than the kingdom of darkness. That's good news, isn't it? And this is the truth. And this is an overview of all that God has done and wants to do in your life. And I pray that it will encourage you now in these latter sessions to stand up and say, Scott, I want more. <laughs> I want more. Because I agree with God. What about you? Do you want more? Are you hungry for more? I pray that right now, the Lord would rise up in your heart and you would say yes. So just to close this session, I'm just going to take you through a short prayer because this session connects with the next session, so we'll have a longer ministry time then. But right now, I just want to do one thing. I want us to reject the lies of the devil and agree with God. Can we stand, please? Just close your eyes and just let the Holy Spirit right now bring the truth of what you've heard more into your heart. Let your heart be like a sponge right now and soak up the truth you've just heard. And by faith right now, I want you to see yourself in Christ. You're not in Adam anymore. You're not under the curse anymore. You stand in Christ so much so that in Ephesians it says that you've been seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Wow. That's where you are right now, positionally, by faith, with Christ.
And so right now, I'm just going to ask the Holy Spirit to come and reveal to you any lies that you may be believing. Again, we're going to go deeper into this in one of the later sessions, but I want to start now by watering the ground of our hearts with truth. Holy Spirit, in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray that you would come now and reveal to us any lies of the devil that we have been believing. Lies about ourselves, lies about you, lies about our life, lies about others, whatever it is. Just listen right now, just for a minute. And just let the Lord show you maybe some of the things that we already mentioned. That those are lies in your heart today. Come, Holy Spirit. And what I want to do is I'm going to lead you in a prayer to reject these lies. In other words, what we're going to do is we're going to rip up those contracts of agreement with the devil. We're going to rip them up in our hearts and in our minds right now. And then we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to come and speak the truth to us. Because the truth of God always brings life and freedom. So I want you to pray out loud after me right now by faith, believing that through Christ right now, you can tear up these agreements and break the authority that the enemy has in that area of your life by rejecting him and his lies. So let's do that right now by faith. I want you to pray after me. Let's pray right now. Lord Jesus, I come to you today, and I declare you are the truth and the life. And I choose now to reject the lies of the devil. In Jesus' name, I reject now these lies, now name them. Quietly, right where you are, name them. What are you rejecting? And say, I reject and name the lie. And when you do it, cast it out of your heart. Cast it out of your mind by faith. Hate these lies. Tear them up right now. They are not who you are. You are a new creation. And so I'm just going to ask right now, Holy Spirit, come and speak to us the truth. Just let God speak to you the truth right now. Just listen to the Spirit. His truth of love, his truth of acceptance, his truth of affirming you, his truth of bringing value to your life. Let his truth come right now. And when it comes to your heart, say this, Jesus, I agree. So even though you may not feel like it, agree with it by your will. Agree with God right now and let that truth come into your life. More Holy Spirit. 
Spirit of the Lord, let the truth go deep into our hearts right now. Water our hearts with truth. Water our hearts with the message that we've heard right now. I pray hope into you right now. I believe that this message was a seed of hope for many of you. That you can see now God's way forward. Thank him for this. And agree in your heart with his road of life. Now, closing this session, I want you to put your hand on your heart. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer of declaring truth over yourself. So in other words, you're going to agree with God and you're going to declare it right into your heart right now. All the truths that he has spoken to you, I'm going to let you declare it over yourself. So let's pray. Pray after me right now. Lord Jesus, I choose today to agree with you. And I declare now right into my heart these truths. So declare them right now. What are they? Speak them over your heart. Water your heart right now with the truth of God. Let the power of truth plant new seeds into your heart right now. Yes that I am a child of God. Yes, that I am deeply loved and accepted by my Heavenly Father. That, Lord, you have good plans for me. That you are filling my heart with peace and security. That, Lord, I live under the waterfall of your love, under the banner of your love. That I walk in truth and not in lies. Thank you that nothing can separate me from you, Heavenly Father. So, Lord, we thank you now for all that you've done. We pray that you would protect and deepen the power of your word and your work deep into our hearts right now. We give you thanks in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord.